This is a special saber. You don't see these around much anymore. This was made by my coach, by hand, Maestro Laos Chisar. Some of you know the name, some of you won't, but uh, he's a historic figure in, f in fencing in Europe, then in, the, in Philadelphia and in the United States. He was Olympic coach in 56 and so on. And he, was, he liked doing stuff with his hands. So this saber is handmade from Duralum. It's an aircraft alloy. Indestructible. Don't, don't test it because you'll break something on it. Okay. The blade is a rather no normal current blade, and the handle is a current one. But this is special because there are only a few of them left in the world, it, and certainly in this brand new condition. And the reason I brought it here is because I have the last few. And this is a special gift for our host coach. Oh. Oh. Mm. oh, thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, and why, why give a, a guy a saber? Number one, because it's special. Number two, because what he does is special. He's dedicated to teaching not only fencers, but coaches, giving clinics, developing the sport. And this is my way of saying thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Let me tell you about me, because some of you don't know. Um, I started to fence when I got to college. I had never fenced before. It's a little bit of a, a, a tale of, uh, huh? <laughs> I had never played any sports competitively at all. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania, when I'm entering freshmen, um, would have to designate if they played any sports before, or any activities before, and so on. It's the card they give out to see if anybody coming in was going to want to do something at Penn. But in, or in order to get your pick of what things you would do, they had a freshman physical efficiency test. It, uh, it uh, had to do with uh, agility and jumping and push-ups and, and pull-ups and all kinds of stuff like that, uh, mostly an emphasis on upper body strength, which absolutely was not my forte at all. They had a, a chart of points by what you did, so similar to a modern pentathlon points chart. And uh, 200, 340 was a perfect score, 200 was of passing, and I scored 100. So I did not have the option of choosing one of the sports classes. I had to go into a remedial gym. The story goes a little farther than that, because uh, I had been in a sit-down pep band when, in my high school. And so, of course, I put down, <laughs> I, pl I played the drums and the cymbals in the, in the, in the band at the at Wyoming Seminary. And so they said, come out and try out for the, uh, for the band. They were short one person. They had an empty uniform, and, and the, the charts all had a gap. Would I put on a uniform and, and march with the team, uh, with the, the band, just to fill in the formation? I said, sure, I'd love to. So I, I suited up, and I learned how to walk from over here to over there and stand there. And they gave me a trumpet, which had belonged to the drum major, but no mouthpiece in case I got to be a wise guy. This is all true stuff. So anyway, they, they kept me on in, the, in the band as uh, eventually uh, uh, played the cymbals. I was the number two cymbal man in a big marching band, military style marching band at that. And so uh, they, I, I, was, I was, on the, t I was on, the, on the band team, we called it the team, the band. And we had re rehearsals twice a week, high intensity, we did a military march at 180 steps a minute, and I didn't have to go for a run. <laughs> and so, uh, because of that, the, rec the, re the requirement of entering freshmen to take the basic gym was waived during football season because I was already doing a couple of hours of this, a couple of hours of that, and a whole lot of Saturday. And it was all very physical. So they said, it's waived, you don't have to take it. Next story is, I had a job working in the dining service uh, at a, a cafeteria type line and I was putting up rolls and butter and, and serving soup and the guy next to me was serving meat and vegetables and he was a sophomore and he had started fencing as a freshman he said you ought to come out for fencing I said I don't know how to fence he said keywords the maestro will teach you I was sold 
And uh, th there's a lot more to go in this, but uh, I went down to the fencing room and I, I took the, f the class, which was very basic, with Maestro and Rusty Bent Foils. And uh, then, so Johnny, who's my friend, said, well, did you get, did you get a lesson? I said, well, what's a lesson? <laughs> and so he said, go back to the fencing room when the practice is on. He was a sophomore on the team. And he said, ask Maestro for a lesson. And so I went back and I sat there and I said, Maestro, I'd like to have a lesson, please. He says, sit, watch. So I sat and I watched all Americans, <laughs> varsity stars, get up and take their lessons. And finally say, he says to me, come, I'll give you a lesson. I've been watching, hoping to absorb something. It's on guard. And I had taken the class, so I, I thought I knew what on guard was. So I got on guard, and he says, lunge. So I did what I thought was a lunge that he had taught. He says, terrible. On guard, lunge. Miserable. <laughs> Good Hungarian accent. Miserable. And, and the third time, he says, if you can't make good straight lunges, waste of time to give you lessons, and it was over. <laughs> this is verbatim true. I realized many years later, this, this is how he cut the team. If you leave, you should. I didn't leave. And so I came back the next day. I, I, oh, I, I had my friend Johnny uh, take me down to the mirror and, and show me what he wanted, what Meister had wanted and why I wasn't doing it. I thought I was. He said, no, he, here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to extend first, then pick up the foot, and then lunge. It's not how, how fast, but he wants the sequence right. Okay. Next day I said, Meister, I can lunge now. May I have a lesson? I, I had practiced at the mirror. He said, sit. So I sat and I watched for a while, and everybody was done. He says, come, I'll give you a lesson. Okay. So, on guard. Lunge. <whistles> Boom. We weapon was really first. Lunge. <whistles> Boom. <laughs> okay, you can lunge. Now I can give you lessons. And that's when it all got me into trouble for the rest of my life. <laughs> He was right. If you didn't want to learn and you didn't want to get it right, what are you doing here? I, I didn't leave. I kept coming back to practices. I would work, uh, pick the brains of uh, the, the uh, uh, older fencers. We, we had a club that met at our fencing room in the evenings. Sometimes I would come earlier in the afternoon and fence with the, with the, uh, the team. Olympians and national champions and, uh, and so on just wander into our fencing room. You remember some of these guys, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Paul Mackler, if you remember Paul that. Mackler, right. Yeah, he passed away not too long ago at the age of 102. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Dick Dyer, who had been the national saber champion and an Olympian and, a, and, a Pan, and the Pan Am Epe champion. One guy, big heavy guy. He, he had been a, a, a lineman on the, on the Penn State football team. And oh, by the way, he fenced. He was a very good fencer, very good hand. And these, there were others that would come by and, and fence with the members of the team and give tips and, and so on. And there was a, a very en enriching environment for, for a young fencer. Whatever they tell you to do, just do, and later on ask why. So, yeah, if, if a, a man who is a class A fencer in all three weapons, who is an Olympian, the North American champion in three weapons, and, and oh, by the way, a practicing physician in, in his regular job, Dr. Paul Mackler, if he tells you to do something, you listen. It, it, it's a prof professorial tutorial. He was down at the fencing room, and there was just the two of us at that time waiting for other people to come in. He said, would you like to fence? Yes, I would like to fence. So we, we hooked up, and we started fencing Epe. And I, I got a touch, and I got a touch. And I got up to a 4 nothing lead. And then we started fencing some more, and he got a touch. And then fenced some more, he got another touch. He got up to 4-4, four, four and he made the fifth touch. He beat me 5-4 when I'd been leading 4 nothing. I already tells you I was a rookie, but the, aside from that, he said, he said, do you want to go another bout? I said, sure. 
So we did the same thing. And I got, I got the first touch. I got up to 4 nothing, And he came back and beat me 5-4. So there's obviously something, something going on here that isn't just doing stuff. Third bout comes up. He says, want to do one more? I said, sure. And uh, so we got on guard again. And once again, I got ahead 4-0. T- puts his weapon down. He says, well, do you give up? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was no, but I should have. <laughs> <laughs> I've said it because it's an, an enriching thing in my background to have these people with you in, in, your, in your world. P- people who know what they're doing, don't mind showing and teaching, testing you, mentoring you and ch- challenging you. Uh, Ty- Tyrone used to come down to our fencing room in, in, in for, for the club sessions and sometimes in the afternoons earlier and fence with the t- pe- pen guys. But that back time, that was permissible. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, he would come and fence at the club. And some of his club mates came too. Anyway, so that, that's a background thing. On this. The other thing was every time there was a chance to fence. I would go and fence. There were local competitions at, at, at in Philadelphia. Most of them were at Penn, not all, but most. <coughs> Whatever the weapon was, I'd go fence. And the same thing with the uh, 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 sectionals, I'd go fence. Then I uh, got a little better, and they started saying, you know, the better competitions and those stronger fences are actually in New York. So I, eventually I started to have to hop the train up to New York and schlep my bag to the New York Athletic Club or to the Fencers Club and get one of these competitions that were opens. I think the first one I fenced in, I got fifth and went home. And then the next one, I got third. Next time, I got third. So I started collecting bronze medals by going up to New York. And little by little, I got better. And of course, the... Um, some of the more experienced uh, fencers would try to talk me out of what I was doing because, oh, you're, you're not doing that right. They wanted me to stop doing what was working. <laughs> right. Well, that's okay. Thank you for your advice. And one fellow, uh, 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 name was James Melcher, uh, who was a national champion a couple of times. And uh, he was an Olympian and uh, he, he was quite a good fencer. His coach and my coach were like this. Both good, different. See. We'd, we'd fence about, and then he, after the bout, he would tell me why I had fenced incorrectly. <laughs> I said, well, okay. The ne- next time I said, well, uh, look at the score sheet. <laughs> so it may not be what you're doing, but it's not necessarily incorrect, s- since the, the V is on my side. <laughs> you know, no, he said, it'd be much better if you did blah, 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 blah. So uh, this, was, this was the gauntlet I had to run to, to get respected by these Guys in New York who went to the Fences Club, the New York AC, NYU, where they had uh, national level coaching and so on. And a, c- a couple of us would, g- would go up by car and get into these competitions and get a couple of medals and go home. <laughs> so uh, apparently it was quite correct. I was not fencing correctly in the terms of the coach that was coaching them. Because he was a, a classic Orthodox French coach who had already made a world champion at age 17. If I tell you the name, it was Christian Doriola, possibly the greatest foil fencer in the history of the sport, world champion at 17. The coaches would say, you know, every day to be a fencer, you must make 100 lunges every day. I said, that sounds like a lot, but I'll, I'll try. The world championships in 1958 were at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, we went down to our fencing room, it was be- below the gymnasium floor was our fencing room. And Doriola came in and walked down to the corner and he had, saw the pad on the wall and he saw the mirror there and he started lunging. And kaboom, 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 kaboom. He did a hundred lunges like he was saying hello. Okay. And then I saw vi- film, actually not video, that Dick Dyer had taken at the 56 Olympics where Doriola had, had won. And I saw the, uh, how he applied the, uh, that ability. He, he could lunge from here to downtown and back and be back in one tempo. Zoom, boom. Like, 
almost like a slinky or a rubber band or something. You know, boom, boom. And the muscles would stretch and recontract. And so I said, I want to be able to do that. Now, to, to be Doriola, I wasn't. But to copy his method, his, his timing, his coordination, that was what I was modeling myself after in terms of being able to lunge and recover. And I had a huge lunge and get back in one tempo. I said, that's a, that's a tactical weapon. And so I was able to apply that in Epe. So the length of the lunge, I mean, if people would try to make a parry, and if they let go of a little bit, I was still there. Or I, if they would come after me, I, I would be back on guard before they could take a step forward. So then by coming forward, I would find the blade and hit, or just nail them on the, on the march, either one. But the ability to make a really good lunge resiliently and get back on balance and, and move immediately thereafter is a tremendous strategic advantage, but, and, but tactically applied. Now, not everybody can do it, and not everybody should do it, because there's lots and lots of ways to fence. But if you can do that, it's something you should really make a game around. Now, as you get older, and uh, if you're lucky, you get older, and um, you, some, some of the things you used to be able to do probably can't quite still do. I can still make a lunge and a recovery, but it doesn't resemble what I did when I was 24. But for a lot of reasons. My knee hurts, my hip hurts, the muscles aren't what they used to be. Okay, I can't, but I can teach it. And if I can find somebody who can say, well, I can say, go like this, and they can understand what I'm saying, get out and get back. Maestro used to talk about it as being like a yo-yo. You go down the string and right back up again. So I said, good metaphor. I didn't know Hungarians from Romania would, lo would know that. <laughs> he knew what a yo-yo was, and he said, zoom, zoom, yeah? So I make the lunge, boom, boom. And the, um, the reflexive recontraction of the, of the large skeletal muscles just reverses the direction. So you just, you, you, hit, you hit bottom, and as those muscles recontract, you picked up your toe, and you roll back off the heel, and you develop a backward momentum, and you put your foot down under you, and then you can do anything you want. If people want to reach out and hit you with a riposte, they're giving you the blade. Cool. What I'm getting at here is a whole lot of gibberish about my background and why I teach some things a certain way, because I think it's good for you to understand that. Meister told me, be a yo-yo. He wasn't talking about the mentality. <laughs> uh, and uh, eventually, in 19, what year was it? 1960, he was uh, coaching for the, in the summers up at Camp uh, Tecumseh in New Hampshire. It's on Lake Winnipesaukee. And he went up there every summer, and he coached fencing there. He taught fencing there. His family got to stay in the cottage and take, the, take advantage of facilities. And he, he was up there teaching fencing and teach and basics. He wasn't, he wasn't going to be a purist with a bunch of young kids camping, but they enjoyed what they were doing. He taught them saber instead of foil because he said it's more natural. So in, in, before the Nationals in 1960, Larry Anastasia and I went up to Tecumseh, and, and we earned our keep by cleaning here and there. And uh, we stayed there, and we got lessons every day. The lessons were on a, a diving board that had been retired, about half as wide as that, and uh, about that far off the ground, as which a diving board would be. And we learned how to have linearity in what we were doing. If you wandered off to the sides, it was a bad idea. So you have to be able to correct in midair, get your orientation of your body. So we got up to the, the 60 nationals, and I, my maestro told me, you, you have to do very well there. I said, well, I, I, can make the, I can make the top five or six up there. I'll, I'll make the Olympic team. He said, if you are not in the first three, you will not get to fence Eduardo Manjarotti, who was my idol. My maestro's idol. And therefore, he became my idol. And uh, you can look him up. There's plenty to find out about Eduardo Mangiarotti. Just a nat international gold medal, so it was, you count him in the 30s in different weapons. So I, he was, it was my dream to fence Eduardo. So I said, OK, well, I'll have to beat the guys I can beat and some of the others, and I'll, I'll, get a, I'll be in the top three. Well, to shorten the story, 
that they had pools by then, and the final was a, a round robin of eight. And I won about, and I won about, and I won about, and I won about. And this guy was a guy really tough because he was one of these blade grabbers, you know. So if, and if, if I let him hold my blade, he was going to hit me. So I let him touch my blade, and then when he went for my blade again, boom. <laughs> I, put, I, I beat him five zip because I was scared of him. I was. And then uh, I fenced some more, and next thing we know, I had fence. Uh, Jerry Halpern, who was a, 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 an NYU fencer, but he was also a, a very high-level national fencer. A, a number of the other people in there had been Olympians or national medalists and so on. It was a, a very elite eight people. The people from uh, New England remember Ralph Spinella. So you know the name. He came, he came in second. I'd been fencing him in the New York Opens, and he was killing me every time. Other people were fencing more orthodox style. He was very unorthodox, and I, I just, I couldn't do anything with him. So, Maestro was watching me. I was getting up to fence him in the semifinals of the nationals. He says, "Just don't give him blade." I wasn't giving him my blade. <laughs> I said, "Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep, keep it back." I challenged him. He would lunge way down low, and as you came forward, he would recover and hook you. So if you, if you followed him back, you got nailed. So I had to figure out what to do. Don't, don't give him blade was not enough material. And he didn't tell me the details, Maestro. He said, don't give him blade. But I said, if I let him finish that lunge and then start for him, he'll be recovering before I can get there. So as he, when he starts down, I have to begin my, my flesh. So by the, by the time he finishes going downward, I'll be too close for him to do anything about it. He'll try to hook, but I'll be there. Okay, okay. Got, that's the first time I ever beat him in my life. Lo and behold, we're both in the finals. Top eight. And I said, well, it worked last time. I'm not sure he's going to have solved it. And he hadn't solved it. <laughs> and I wound up... Uh, I won, I won all my bouts in the final and won the Nationals that year. Fifth year of fencing. Now, what the, I'm not saying that to brag because I worked my off and that's what I'm telling you about. It's not just how much sweat, but an intelligent sweat. Uh, and the, the, for the purpose of teaching people, you want them to work, you want them to develop their muscles, you want them to develop their skills, their balance, and all these abilities you have to have if you're standing there by yourself. But you still have to be able to link it to an opponent and have a, a strategic and, an, and a, a tactical application of things and, and variations that work with this fencer, work with this fencer, then work with that fencer, and so on. I wound up uh, winning that national and made the Olympic team in 60. And then I first learned about fencing at the Olympic Games. <laughs> And that, that's where you start to learn when, when you're fencing people of that caliber and what you do right and what you do wrong. If it's wrong, they just hit you. And some things that, that weren't being done in anybody else, but uh, uh, people, Delfino from the Italian team, used to hold back on the pommel and, and do pokes and hooks and whips and all that. If you attacked him here, he'd, he'd take a second, and, and as, you, as you come around that, he'd just go on top of your arm. Or if you did an invitation, he'd go pop you on the hand. <laughs> I could make touches on him, but I couldn't beat him. I, I, I went to 5-4 with him in the, in the team event. I said, but there's a way. So when, when you have a background of being able to fence good fencers and see what is the way, what is a potential way, with this particular person, it may be something you do for somebody else, but in this person, you have to have a book here. And some people t take written notes. A couple of words would be enough. But you have to have a visual that you c I can s I used to tell people the night before a fencing competition, during the night, I would be fencing the people I expected to have to fence the next day in my head. A crazy person, that's me. But, uh, you know, it still works. I have shared some of my thoughts with you about 
not only learning how to fence, but ha- how to teach people to fence, how to make people want to learn how to fence, and then remembering that there is no one way. Every situation, you, you have to have a basic game, a basic repertoire, and understand why you do things a certain way, but then understand against whom and why and when. That is part of growing up as a, f- a competitor in almost any sport, but in fencing for sure, because it's always one against one, and you have to know What's he doing? What do I know how to do? What, what can I make him do wrong? Or what can I make him do predictably and have something to do against it? Is it a, is it a distance game? Is it a velocity game? Is it a, a technical uh, repertoire? The, the, you don't have to have the, the world's greatest repertoire. You have to have stuff that works. And if it works against a lot of people, it can become your game. I, I didn't know what the word was. It's just, just fence your game, one of the guys told me. I said, I don't know what the hell that is. What's my game? It, th- there is an explanation of what's your game. It consists of the things you know how to do, the things you know against whom to do, and how you interweave that with what the opponent's doing. You, you, nobody has a game, in quotes, by, by himself. It's what you do with opponents. So when you're teaching fencing, you have to teach, if you're giving individual lessons, you teach repertoire, and then you teach situational variations, and the fencer learns to cope with situations, distances, techniques, repertoire, greater repertoire, lesser repertoire, simpler repertoire. When you're teaching a fencer to all this, you have to say, yes, you know how to do this, and now here's how you use it. Now, if he solves that this way, here's what you do next. You make him do that. Don't let him do it. You make him do it. And as he does it, this is what you do next. And this is how you build up a fencer's understanding of strategy and tactics. It's all situational. But your situation is always governed by what you can do. So you you have things to choose from. And it's it's important that when you develop a fencer, you can't teach them the whole thing. There is no such thing as everything. But you can teach enough stuff that can be relied upon and they can be confident with and then they can figure out, with your help or ideally by themselves, against whom and when. What the sequence of actions should be. How can I lure him into hitting himself? How can I prevent him from hitting me? How can I get to the distance so he can't stop me? How can I get to the distance so he can't reach me? How can I change direction so when he's finished moving, I, I, I have the next word in the conversational blades? I always like to have the next word. and so. This has been a lot of gibberish, and I hope it's been meaningful to you, because uh, every time I tell it, it's different, but it always comes up with the same thing. Uh, first of all, you mentioned Michel Allo. He was the o- Olympic coach one year, and my coach wasn't going, and so we practiced a little bit for lessons. He, he gave a, a very orthodox, straightforward French lesson, but with some accents about speed, acceleration, and so on. So I took a few lessons from him, quite differently. He, he knew he wasn't going to change my fencing, but he had things that he wanted to share with me. And so he taught me when the, the moment came for a flesh against an opponent who was in second intention. He comes in like this and he wants me to go here so he can go boom, boom. He said, if you're going to go there, you must go like a bullet. Don't thrust. Fire. Not his verbatim, but that, that's what he taught me. And so in the Olympic Games, I was fencing in a pool which included Kaus from Hungary, who had been a world champion. And he would, his game looked like to me, because he watched me fence. The, 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 there's more stories in that, in that pool. It was a wonderful <laughs> exercise to talk about. But he was in there. And he, was, he was giving me this search for the blade, and boom, boom. I said, it is open but I have to have the distance and I have to get full penetration before he can complete the parry. Michelle's lesson in the middle of the bout in the Olympic Games. So he came in and he gave me this invitation. I went, boom! And he parried it right off his arm and the light was on. He was astounded that it had hit because he didn't realize I had gotten past his defense. Did it a couple more times and we shook hands. Because he was beating people with this all over the place. He had hit me a couple times with it. I said, I'm right, but I've got to be that much closer when he completes the parry. 
So I took Michelle's lesson. Because Michelle was quite a clever coach. Uh, and it wasn't just mechanics. It was, it was in a situation. One of the other coaches came up to me after and said, why didn't you just make Faint disengage? Well, good idea. But I thought this would work, and it did. <laughs> Should I make a boom, boom? Too obvious, apparently. <laughs> if I give him what he thinks he wants, and he's not right, <laughs> I get the touch. Now, that's risky, because he was getting to do his action. But uh, and that's, for, for a lot of people, that's very risky. You're much better to either tell him what to do or prevent him from doing what he wants to do as a matter of bout structure. But if you're going to hit him with it, <laughs> go. So that, that's a, an adventure about working with another coach and, and learning a, a principle which applies in all circumstances if you have the right circumstance. <laughs> it applies all over the place, but you have to apply exactly at the right moment, exactly at the right distance, about exactly with the right execution. And then if you can do that, that then now you have a weapon. That's ammo. And some of these anecdotes are how you sell the sport. You show the, the, the joy and the satisfaction and the achievements and even the uphill stuff that you've had or you know about. And that, that motivates people to, to take up fencing, not to quit. And uh, if, if they haven't got it now, work on it so they can get better at it until it becomes a part of the repertoire. See, built into this whole stuff has been the method and the reward. Okay. How do you take somebody who never fenced, never played a sport in his life, and, and in five years make the Olympic team? Majored in fencing, minored in college. And thank God I was in a college that I, where I could do that. <laughs> he said, if you can't make a good lunge, he didn't say, you can't make a good lunge, go away. He said, if you can't make a good lunge, it's a waste of time to give you lessons. I heard the if. And Johnny took me aside. <laughs> Dr. Schrecker now, PhD in, in Asian studies, by the way. <laughs> Uh, he explained to me what Maestro wanted me to do. And the next day I said, Maestro, I can do that now. May I have a lesson? He made me wait. And then I, he put me on guard. And he said, lunge. And I, I did what I expected him to want. And he, that's what he wanted. He said, OK. I had passed the first cut. And he was, he was very encouraging be, because I, I didn't quit what a lot of people did. People with more athletic talent and experience quit in the freshman year because they didn't have it to uh, see up here someplace. They saw, eh, been there, done that, never mind. So I wound up uh, number one on the freshman team in Epe out of three. <laughs> and little by little, I, I, when people, uh, Maestro went to the Olympic Games as the coach, he said, practice every day while I'm gone. And a few people came, and the rest didn't bother. I was there every day. You hang this in front of somebody, and you, and you make them go like this. And you don't make it impossible, but you make it just difficult enough that if they get it right, they can, they can get a bite of that apple, or whatever it is. Maestro. He was, he was critical, but he was very rewarding. If, if, if he did something right, he says, it's good. You, you could win. If it was over, he says, good lesson today. Meanwhile, the lesson might have been very difficult or not very perfect. Per perfect doesn't exist in fencing anyway, but it can get closer. <laughs> um, and uh, he, he would say, be encouraging. Challenging during the lesson. Sometimes during the lesson, he would be rewarding of uh, how you did something correctly that he was trying to get across to you. You know, I, I still teach some of the stuff that's exactly the same way he taught it to me. And it's not exactly last week. A lot of fencing is junior high school physics. And it's, it's, it's not the be beginner physics, but, but it's maybe second semester. 
And so I stopped being a physics major, became a sociology major, and learned defense. <laughs> That's for real. The, the whole idea is there are all kinds of ways to win. Score sheet is what other people will notice, but there are a lot of personal victories that take place in, in the, over your lifetime. And, the, and in fencing, they can be getting an action right when you didn't have, and said so that's a win. Chalk it up. I never could beat this guy. That's a win. And you don't have to brag about him. Just take some satisfaction from it. Because the satisfaction loop is what re-energizes the motivation. Coach, coach said, that wasn't, I didn't do that. Don't say you're lousy. You say, you didn't do it correctly. If you tell a guy he's lousy, he's liable to believe you and leave. Or take it as a challenge and you, he won't be your friend. He may not want to be your, co your student anymore. But you say, it wasn't done correctly. Here's why it should be done differently. And here's what to do. Let's do it, do it, and do it, and do it. it and then they say, yes, that's right, that's right, that's right. And that's much better. That's good. Great. Good lesson today. And what happens in that lesson? I just ran it through in about 60 seconds. You took somebody who was uncertain and made him proud of himself. I'm going to come back, go back and get some more of that. Right? Unearned praise is nothing special. So when you get them started and they feel rewarded and they enjoy it and, it's, and, and, and they learn how th that they can be better at it and they can, you know, I'll, do, I'll do, th do three of these, next time I'll be able to do four. Or I'll do three of these, next time I'll do it better. Uh, it, that that, that re reward loop that you, you create for people to, is what gets them coming back. And you want the, want the kids to tell the parents how much they enjoy what they're doing and why they can do things better now. What did he teach you? Well, they should know what you taught them. Not just how, but why. And uh, he taught me how to, to beat a guy who was six foot six. Uh, and he taught, this is what he showed me. He says, well, be patient and be six foot four. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't play. <laughs> May even be accurate, but that, that's not, that's not going to be motivating. But the idea of, uh, what did you learn at, at school today, Johnny? <laughs> right? It has to be a little bit um, more serious than that. Tell, tell me what, the, what, you, uh, what you learned at, uh, at fencing today. Did you have a lesson? Yes. But what was the lesson about? The, the kids should know. When I open the line, make a direct thrust. If when you make a direct thrust, I make a parry, what should you do? I make a parry, so then you go back and make a parry. And it, it's still your point. See? And uh, uh, step by step by step with the young kids, they develop the pleasure of doing it and the reward. Now that's only at the teaching level. Sometimes they, the parents will get their kids into heavy competition that they're not ready for, e either technically or emotionally. And if they've been patted on the head and told how wonderful they are f for months, and they get into a, 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 an age group competition where the, the, uh, the opponents have, uh, in, the, in the direct elimination tableau have been fencing competitively for as long as this kid's been taking to get beginner lessons. So they get on the strip, and the kid gets his head handed to him on merit. And when, every time I was a referee and I'd see this young waif come off the strip with tears in his eyes, so I take him aside, gently. I, I said, you're upset, and I understand why you're upset. And it's okay to be upset. But never let your opponent see you cry. I, I, I had to learn that myself much later. When I lost a bout that cost us a gold medal in the, in the F8 team championship at Nationals, I, I got out of sight of everybody and I cried. I had let the team down. I wasn't a kid anymore. But, but you have to kind of measure that. You want them to want to win. You want them to be happy when they win. And as I've said many times to even more mature fencers, everybody who loved you yesterday will still love you tomorrow. That's, 
And that, that's okay. Write that one down. That's a good one. Well, people who take the challenge are probably going to do well. People who say, oh, well, I'll give up. Like I, like I said with Maestro's first lesson, if you quit, you should. But if you say, I will do this, the coach has to find a way to make that come out of people, but it has to be in there. And Jim Moss was one of those. And he, he was like a big brother to him. He wasn't, wasn't the, the, a, a master. He, he was an advisor, a teacher, a, a leader, and, and their representative. He was their, their, their pillar in, in, in the, uh, the, the structure of the program. I knew him well, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing it, it works, it's probably a good idea. But he, he understood his audience. He, he understood these kids, and they understood him. And he wasn't bashful with them, but he, but he was fair with them. You, you, you make things out of substance, not thin air. So you, you, have, the, you have to have people that, that are of substance, that can be molded and, and intri- uh, introduced to it and mo- uh, motivated and so on. And th- th- this is a, a, a lab on how to coach, much different from what you thought you were going to get when you walked in here. A, a different version and a, and a good application of some things I was getting at, mm-hmm. and I understand what you're, go- what you're doing. You lost a bout, you didn't lose your life. Get up there and, and get ready for the next one. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you gotta give yourself a break. You're still a worthwhile human being. That's all okay, but I don't want that to happen again. I have to do something different, better, read the opponent better, read the situation better, get myself mentally protected, uh, prepared better, have more repertoire or maybe less repertoire so I don't confuse myself. These are all the adjustments you can make to say the next time I'm going to be in the anchor bout and there's an important match, I know how to win. It's not know what to do in the bout. You have to know how to win. You, you, you have to be, I will not lose. I will win. If you start saying that loud enough, they're going to have you carried away. But, <laughs> <laughs> but on the other side, you, you have to believe that if you do right things in the right way at the right moment, you can win. Not will, but I can I can, I must, I will. I can, I must, I will. Strategy and tactics are aspects of the ability to tell lies. You tell them what you want them to know. You, want them, you, you tell it to them very credibly. And then when, when, you, when you do it, and he does what you have taught him to do, you go, ha ha. <laughs> I was lying. <laughs> I'm going to attack you in six. See, just like this, like this. So, so then you go out there and you go like this and he goes like that and you go, boop. <laughs> what happened? Oh, I, I lied to you. <laughs> now, you don't, get, you don't say that out loud, but you show people what they should do in a, made, a way that makes them want to do it. Sometimes it's instantaneous and sometimes it's prolonged. You build it up. It, it, you can't show everybody everything you know all in one day. And say, I'm going to do this and you have to stop me. Right. Or try to stop me because I bet you you can't. Right. And as soon as they figure out how to stop me, you go, <laughs> or go around it and say, that, that's, that's a solution to the problem you, you created. So instead of being a straight attack and getting hit with a repose, it, it, it's a, <laughs> it, it's a so, suddenly it's, it looks like a straight attack, but it ain't <laughs> telling lies. It, it's not a, a bad thing to do in a, in a, a tactical sport. It's how you pro- Unless you are so fast and so strong that you can't be stopped no matter what they know, you have to make them believe your lies. It's okay. There was a fellow who was a, a foil fencer at the Fencers Club in New York City. His name was Marvin Grafton. And he was very fat, but he was very successful and very dominating. And so he was, uh, he was a trickster in foil. He wasn't an epee fencer or a saber fencer. But he, he won a lot of bouts. He, he was very successful as a foil fencer. Up, up to a certain point, he was approaching national level. 
even though he wasn't particularly agile or in very good shape. So uh, we, the, the, uh, the team Epe competition at the Nationals came up, and he was going to be fen had, they had to bring him into fence Epe on the Epe team because they were one person short, and he knew which end to hold. Uh, and so he says, and I was known for hitting people on the foot. I, I had, a, I had a, a, from here to downtown Philly and back in, the, in, one, in about a second, and the light would be on him because I'd hit the foot. So he walks up to me and he says, We're, I'm going to fence on the F-A team, and I'm going to bet you 10 bucks you will not hit me on the foot. And I said, Marv, not only will I hit you on the foot, I will hit you on your back foot. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that stopped his braggadocio. <laughs> and as the bout started, I, I made some false actions toward his back foot. And he started doing stuff like this. I hit him in the chest. What the hell? <laughs> he certainly got the message that he was in over his head. And, and his, his mouth was doing what, it, what his hand couldn't, couldn't achieve. <laughs> he, he was kidding around, but... but I was kidding around too, but I, I just wanted him to understand that he was he's messing with the boss here. <laughs> <laughs> they're not just history, but they're history for a purpose. And generally when, you, when you hear old geezers t telling their war stories from way back when, uh, and, uh, see if there's a message in it for, for, not even for yourselves who are younger than the geezers, but the kids you're trying to coach, you have to find stories that they'll find interesting and motivational. Don't do anything that they're not strong enough to do. That's, that's any part of your body. Don't do anything that is not strong enough to, to be able to do the action w safely. Weight, weight training or strength training is a better word than weight training. Strength training is a valuable part of combat sports. Very valuable, very important that you ha but tailored to the sport. There are some things you do because this, y your whole body gets better, but there are some things that are part of the game, and you want to be able to do them well enough so that you don't pay a price for trying to do them. So there's a, a preconditioning there. I, I very seldom told somebody to switch from pistol grip to French grip. I almost never told anybody to switch from French grip to pistol grip. But for some people, the, the whole idea of what to hold in your hand is you have to be able to manipulate with your fingers no matter what you're holding. You don't clutch it and punch with it. You have to ma manipulate it. And I'll, sh I'll show some exercises that are for that later on. I remember Paul, Paul Mackler I was talking about before. He, he could put a, 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 a quarter or a 50 cent piece on the back of his hand and flip it from one finger to the next and flip it back again. <laughs> Flip it over. I never could. He just, he just did it for, for the heck of it. He said, I can I can do this. I can do that. I guess if I practice long enough, I could do it. But I get tired of bending over to pick it up. So <laughs> there's, there's only so much of that you can do. There are exercises for f uh, finger dexterity, and uh, stamina, and forearm stamina. S strength you can do with dumbbells and go like this. But stamina is other exercises. And uh, you, you want, if you have the muscles that are strong enough, then they can be relaxed and, and still have finesse. If they're weak and you have to exert maximum contraction of the muscles, it overrules the sensation. That tension overrules the, f f the finesse. So strength is not a, a, a negative thing when it, when it comes to uh, finesse. But, and you can use a French grip if you like. You can use a pistol grip. Don't use a pistol. It's against the law. Uh, what's so funny? <laughs> Did you see? You were listening. That's the problem. <laughs> if you have to exert a sufficient force by overly contracting the muscles so that they're fully contracted and stiff, the sensation, the feedback that those muscles is, is ne negative, negated. <laughs> Negated, well, something like that. Tight muscles don't feel as well as loose muscles, but you have to have enough strength so that when you feel it, you can increase the pressure under control. 
I competed with, uh, with a French grip my whole career except my sophomore year when I used the Spanish grip, uh, which is a, a, a French grip with an up and down prong. And then after a while, I got rid of that because I, I limited some of the actions I wanted to do, the finesse. But some people would, would keep the, the Spanish grip. Some people would uh, switch to uh, uh, Spanish without the top bar and just the bottom bar. And it doesn't, you know, what you're holding is only part of the issue. If you are using a pistol grip, you don't need to clutch it and punch with it. You, but you have more pr pressure points, so you, have, you can develop more subtlety by the different angles of pressure being applied and the different feedback to the pressures you're receiving. But, but you, you can't go like this. And the tempta a lot of coaches in, in the early days of the pistol grips coming into prominence would say, you, you won't have good point control if you use a pistol grip. That's not necessarily true. It's oversimplification. And one time we had a guest coach from Poland, and you may recognize the name, but I say Zbigniew Tchaikovsky. <laughs> he, he's, he's written an awful lot of stuff about fencing. And he was doing a seminar, and he was asked about the, um, the pistol grip, ver, ver, and his fences were using pistol grips. He said, what's the difference of the pistol grip versus the French grip and so on? He says, I get this question all the time, but mostly in America. <laughs> and he said, it, it doesn't matter which one you hold if it's comfortable, and you can feel your weapon, and you can manipulate your weapon with it. Which, whichever one works better for you is fine. But you have, to, you have to teach your hand to control the weapon properly, to respond to uh, pressures and weights and all kinds of angulations. You have to man learn how to manipulate whatever it is. So, I mean, I, I have um, what we used to call a Russian grip, because it had one prong up and a, and a fat pommel. It's not a very easy weapon to master. So what I, I wound up doing was I, I took off the top pouillon, <laughs> and, and now it was an L shape, and, and, and you, it was light, you can manipulate it, but you didn't have to be doing this to move the point. You could still be holding it like this and move the point. Just a little different p uh, point of contact with the handle. So the answer is it doesn't matter what you're holding as long as it's legal under the rules. And if you can feel your weapon, if you can feel the pressures against your fingers, you can make, make the point dance. You should be able to write your name with your tip of your, of your weapon without moving your hand. Try that. That's just, that's just as easy with a pistol grip as it is with a French. Maybe even easier. If it's easier for you to fence well with a pistol, fence. If it's, if it's, if it's easier for you to have more variety in, in, in your technique and with a French than you might be able to have with a pistol grip, then maybe that's for you. There's no right answer. There's wrong things to do. And there's right things to do that you want your equipment to facilitate. Very pragmatic. The rules define what your weapon, weapon handle can be. It, it cannot be so longer than this, and it has to be so this much space where your thumb comes up, and, and all, and all that kind of stuff. I don't have to give you the rule book, but you, you know that it's there. And as long as the weapon is legal, and the angulations at the guard are legal, and the size of the guard is legal, and all that kind of stuff, and just fiddle with it. Make it comfortable in your hand. And then you, after a while, you can do almost anything you want with it. You can go change beat, change beat, change, 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 coupe. How do you change to a coupe? Well, this puts the, the weapon back into your thumb, and this makes it go forward from your thumb. As long as they, these are feeling things, and you respond to pressures with um, constructive responses. If somebody's presses hard on your blade, don't outmuscle them. Get clear of it. You only have to hit first. You don't have to hit fast, but if you can make your opponent never hit you at all, and you hit sooner or later, you're first. If he, if he doesn't land at all, and you land sooner or later, you're first. And the, the epe is a doorbell on the end of a three-foot stick. It's very simple. You push the button, the light goes on. Not a complicated weapon at all. Now, how you create that instant when that takes place, eh, that's when it gets a little tricky. But really, it's just a doorbell. 
the mystique that people apply to things gets in the way of clear thinking. What do I have to do? How, how do I ha what do I want to accomplish? How do I d make it happen? How do I get to the, that moment? How do I keep him from doing what he wants to do? 